We all welcome you to our October Storm of the Month, the Blanco at Wimberley 2015, New Directions in Flash Flood Prediction and Preparedness. This is going to be presented by John Zeitler, and he has a number of contributors at San Antonio to this talk, Aaron Treadway, Jason Runyon, and Jared Allen. You're also going to hear from Greg Waller at the West Gulf River Forecast Center, and I'm pleased to have our first storm of the month that has a contribution between the forecast office and a river forecast center. Thumbs up on that one. Next slide. Just a reminder to the audience that we are building a library of these sessions. We record them. We add content when we can to capture the question and answer session. Next slide. And here are the ground rules. Um, John and company will speak for about 20 minutes, and we will keep the lines muted. We'll go into question and answer. Uh, we will do a formal break at 1230 for those of you that need to leave, um, but we'll keep the discussion going for as long as people are interested. But once we do unmute the lines, by golly, don't press hold and make us listen to No Weather Radio. So having said all that, John, it's all yours. Uh, thanks so much, Jamie. I'm fighting a little bit of a cold here, but I'll try, uh, obviously, not to uh, hack into the uh, microphone. <laughs> if you hear a pause, though, it might be me drinking water. Uh, this flood event occurred uh, this past Memorial Day weekend, and what we're going to focus on is not so much uh, the meteorology of how to forecast such an event, but more how to properly message that, um, including the risk and how to communicate that to your emergency managers uh, and to the public. If we go to the start of that week, on Monday the 18th, our office was already uh, highlighting the flash flood threat uh, six to seven days out. Um, these are some quotes directly taken from uh, partner emergency manager uh, emails that we send out. Um, notice we're focusing on the safety message of turn around, don't drown. We're indicating the risk is higher because it's Memorial Day weekend uh, and that flash flooding is the primary threat. If we jump ahead two days to Wednesday, uh, notice now that we're uh, focusing in a little bit more that uh, it's a flash flood thing. Again, that there's higher impacts expected because it's a holiday weekend, a lot of people camping and, and recreating along the river. Notice we even mentioned that we're probably going to be issuing a flash flood watch. That's a, a keystone product for the agency. Um, it's still two days before we're even going to issue that product, but that's something that some emergency managers and other partners would key off of. If we jump ahead to Friday, now we're one day ahead of the event. Notice again, we're still focusing um, that there's going to be a very high risk of flash flooding. Um, we're expecting rivers to reach flood stage very quickly. We're trying to uh, indicate that because we had had uh, prior rainfall, uh, that the situation could change very rapidly, and therefore the lead time uh, for events may be uh, somewhat limited. Actually, during the event, so this is now Saturday evening, the 23rd, um, we sent out uh, this, and these are just snippets from the email we sent out, but at this point, uh, we're hitting our partners to let them know that even though it was focused on a couple of our basins, a lot of times uh, agencies have mutual aid agreements and such, and it helps them a lot to understand that there might be a, a record event ongoing in a neighboring uh, location. And so, again, we're trying to indicate that at this point that it's an extremely serious situation. We were also issuing a number of special weather statements. These tend to be more geared toward the public, things that play on weather radio, for example, and for the media. Again, similar types of wording. We're talking about the threat timing. We're trying to indicate that it's going to be a Saturday night and a Sunday. Um, we're indicating some amounts. This is even uh, two and three days ahead of what we're expecting. Those amounts were a little bit low, but we're trying to get at least order of magnitude uh, correctness. And again, we're talking about uh, that it's a, primarily a weekend event. Uh, the next slide, when it comes up, will show you the actual isohyadal analysis. The Blanco Basin there is in the red dashed line uh, with San Marcos, which is a fairly major city of 90,000 people uh, at the base of that basin, if you will, extending up into the Texas Hill Country. Notice that the uh, peak amounts were 12 to 13 inches on the upper reaches with a slightly large area of 9 to 11 and a fairly large area of 6 to 8. Um, downstream, which we didn't show in the analysis here, rainfall amounts were relatively minor in the inch to two inch range. So a lot of this flood was from upstream water being routed in the river, not from uh, rainfall that was occurring uh, at the location. If we take a look at the hydrograph, if you use HydroView, you'd be familiar with this. Uh, the blue uh, line with the dots, that's the actual gauge reading uh, in the town of Wimberley on the Blanco River. 
Our first flash flood warning went out at 4.12 in the afternoon for Blanco County. Now that's on the upper reaches of the river in Kendall counties. So again, we're easily um, roughly six to seven hours before the peak event in the town of Wimberley. We've already started issuing flash flood warnings uh, due to high rainfall rates. If we jump ahead now, it's 8.23 in the evening. Now we're issuing flash flood warnings for Blanco and Hayes County. Hayes County would include the lower reaches of the Blanco River, including the town of Wimberley and the city of San Marcos. Notice, though, if you go down to the bottom, we're still basically at base flow. Uh, the river's, in essence, at five feet, if you will. Notice now we jump ahead uh, three more hours to 11.13 p.m. Notice we've taken a rapid rise. We're now up over 20 feet uh, in just a couple hours. Um, we're reissuing, in essence, or continuing the flash flood warning. Notice we've now reached um, well into moderate flood stage. Now keep a look at that time. That's 11.15 p.m. As I go to the next slide, you'll see 15 minutes later we've jumped five feet. So in other words, we've gone five feet in 15 minutes. At this point, we also had spotter reports um, from a rancher and from the emergency manager uh, that this was, in their opinion, a record flood. So we went ahead with a flash flood emergency at this time and noticed that we expected that to continue uh, for many hours because the, the water was basically routed uh, in the river at this time. And so we, we extended it not only for the town of Wimberley, but then uh, tributaries leading to it and going down river. We go ahead here um, another maybe 30 minutes. Notice now we've jumped up to uh, almost 38 uh, feet, 37 and a half feet. At this point, we updated the flash flood emergency and now specifically mentioned uh, San Marcos and the town of Kyle, which is about 30,000 people. San Marcos, again, 90,000. So they actually had quite an extensive lead time. They had a lead time on the order of three, three hours or so for the flash flood emergency because we knew the water was in the channel. It was basically a flood wave that was, that was uh, going to come down, and it did indeed do so and actually shut down Interstate 35 for a number of hours. And then uh, lastly, right before the gauge was wiped out at 40 feet, we again uh, reissued the uh, flash flood emergency to, to now indicate that it was a record flood uh, to try to get people to understand that, um, you know, the typical thing we always see in events is I've never seen this before. We're trying to, to let people know, no, you haven't seen this before and you need to take appropriate action. At this point, I'll switch over uh, to Greg at the West Gulf RFC to talk about uh, what the RFC is seeing and sort of the products uh, and, and considerations they take into account with this type of an event. Thank you, John. Uh, leading into the event, uh, one thing we want to point out is, is this wasn't isolated. Uh, we, the entire month of May, uh, we were very wet across the entire state. Uh, the time frame from May 4th to May 24th, we had somewhere in the state of Texas in the West Gulf River Forecast Center area 20 consecutive days of someone receiving at least a four-inch rain amount. And 10 out of 11 of those days, someone saw at least six inches. And like John pointed out with the Memorial Day flood, you know, we were seeing 12 to 14-inch rain amounts somewhere spread out across the state of Texas. So the soils were very saturated, um, and we knew going in we were already, you know, pardon the term, battle mode, but we were already doing flood operations uh, leading into this event. So go ahead, next slide. One of the things that River Forecast Center, especially ours, is we tend to, to group into a six-hour time step. Uh, the two top images show six-hour rainfalls ending. Uh, the one on the left is at 1Z on May 24th. The one on the right is at 4Z. What we want to point out is the black star is where the Wimberley gauge, the river forecast point, uh, for Wimberley exists, the rain, heavy rain fell upstream of it. Uh, the middle bottom one is actually a 12-hour total. Now, don't really focus on the color scale so much. You know, these are screen captures from CHIPS, Community Hydrologic Prediction System, but it's a spatial viewer on our system. So our hydrologists were able to look and say, hey, look, this rain event, it actually stretched across three different river basins, the San Antonio, the Guadalupe, and then the upstream uh, on the Blanco River system. However, six hours is two course of a time scale. Next slide. If we break it into three-hour chunks, uh, we can see ending at 1Z and ending at 4Z that the rain never really materialized on top of the Wimberley gauge. Like John said, it was well upstream. And so we, we issued our river forecast, and we were low at first. Uh, but as we were coordinating with the weather forecast office, you know, we adjusted our forecast to try to take into account the extreme rain event that um, we were seeing it on our radar. We estimated 
the same values, give or take, that the San Antonio uh, office had with their cooperative observers. We had uh, over 11 to 12 inch rain estimates in the same area that John said 12 to 13. So our rainfall estimates were pretty spot on, but there still was a problem of us being a little bit low uh, on our forecast. So the next slide will show that uh, I was the hydrologist that night. We normally run one person on an evening shift and zero on a midnight shift. Well, on this night, we had five on our evening shift with another four on the midnight shift. And I tried to get our CHIPS model to predict this flood event. Uh, there, you can talk about my forecasting skills later. But uh, you can just see the blue line shows our model simulation. The purple line with the red dots shows the observed what actually happened. Uh, we tried various, you know, changing of times, changing of rainfall amounts to try to catch the volume of water going down uh, this river. This It's a relatively small river. Um, several iterations, couldn't get it to work. It went past the top of our rating curve, and I'm trying to figure out what happened. I mean, why isn't there enough rain? Why isn't there enough runoff? So the next slide, I passed it on. Uh, said, look at the observed hydrograph, the, the, the data that comes in, and try to get me an idea of the volume of water. And one of our senior hydrologists estimated that uh, during this time frame, over eight and a half, or close to eight and a half billion cubic feet of water went through the site at Wimberley, which is, you know, about 195,000 acre feet. Just one river system over, there's a pretty large lake called Canyon. If it was completely empty, it would hold 378 acre feet. So what went down this one, you know, small trip would have, you know, filled, you know, half capacity for one of our bigger lakes in the state. I mean, this is a lot of water here. And then because we're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, I said, yeah, but what if we uh, filled AT&T Cowboy Stadium? They said, well, you'd fill it 82 times and then some. And then we got our official reports uh, from the USGS, and all of our estimates were actually low. Uh, there was more water went through than what we calculated. Next slide. So if you keep the 8.5 billion cubic feet in mind, when we model – the first forecast point on the Blanco system, Blanco system, is at Wimberley, but we break it up into two segments. Most of it fell in the Wimberley upper section. Okay, our model, we call it WBTTU. It is roughly 232 square miles, so if you do the math, uh, about 6.5 billion square feet. Now, our model put 7.2 inches mean aerial across that whole basin. Remember John's slides showed that there was a bullseye in the upper part, but it kind of dropped off as you got closer to the gauge. Well, if you assumed 100% runoff of 7.2 inches across that basin, we're only looking at 3.8 cubic uh, uh, billion cubic feet. We're half the water than what actually went through. So we've tasked ourselves, and we're, we're coordinating with some of the river authorities in the area, you know, what exactly happened because our surface water model just didn't seem to catch the magnitude of this record event. Next slide. And back to you, John. Thank you, Greg. So um, you've seen a little bit of the setup for, for what occurred from the hydrologic standpoint and rainfall standpoint. At the end of the day, of course, it's all about impacts. Um, there were 11 fatalities um, uh, on, on the Blanco, mostly in the Wimberley area. Over 3,000 structures had water in them to some degree, and over 300 homes uh, were destroyed. This is a Relatively, uh, I wouldn't say it's an unpopular area. Wimberley itself is maybe six, 7,000 people, so uh, 300 homes is a fairly substantial portion for that town. But again, if this would occur further downstream towards San Marcos, that's a city of 90,000 people. Um, or like Greg mentioned, it could have been a basin over San New Braunfels, that's a city of 80,000 people. So the situation could have been much different um, than, than what actually occurred. But we're still not over, overall um, satisfied uh, with what happened. So how can we look forward uh, to some things coming and, and what could we do, especially as a WFO or RFC? Well, one of the things to always keep in mind is that our actual forecast, sometimes we, we sort of get inside the numbers a little bit and we sort of forget that the forecasts themselves don't actually have any value. The value comes from when people can make decisions uh, reacting to those and, and to either uh, save lives or property. So that's something to always remember. There's always an engagement with our partners and, and customers and public. Also, I think a lot of times, uh, sometimes we tend to forget, we focus on what the probability of the hazard is. What's the chance of rain? What's the probabilistic QPF? Uh, what's the spread of the ensemble? This type of thing. 
but the actual risk is that multiplied times the degree of vulnerability. And in this case, the degree of vulnerability was higher than normal because it was a holiday weekend. So that's just a sheer more numbers of people along the river than normally would be there on a weekday um, or even a normal weekend day. In addition, visitors from out of town that are totally unfamiliar with the area. Um, so that's an issue. Uh, the flood occurred in the middle of the night. Um, that's common for many flash floods. So that, that's not necessarily any worse, but it's definitely a different situation than if the thing had occurred on a Wednesday afternoon at 2 p.m. Um, lastly, um, one of our emergency managers in relation to another flood a few years ago uh, mentioned that the Weather Service does a really good job at outlooking events, and we do a really good job with warning operations. But many times we tend to go silent in what he calls the tactical space, which is zero to six hours before the event. In other words, the flash flood watches out, the severe thunderstorm watches out, the winter storm watches out, but the event actually hasn't quite started yet. Um, or maybe we've even put a warning out, like a winter storm warning, and it's not quite snowing yet. And we, we often go silent, and, and even though we're getting new information from the radar, satellites, and models, we're not really updating the forecast or conditions or, or maybe increasing the tempo. And he said that's something we could maybe do a better job of, so that's something at least to consider. So, for example, during the event, the upper left corner here, you'll see that we did issue a flash flood watch for our entire CWA. Now, we had to do that. We actually had flash flooding, I think, in 25 of our 33 counties. Um, and notice we put amounts on there, and we even had the timing right. Unfortunately, though, on the upper right is actually our QPF forecast from a similar time. And notice here that even though the threat was CWA-wide, we really had a much better idea that it was going to be our eastern, uh, sort of southeastern two-thirds of our area. Um, and so the graphic on the left indicates a threat, and it's somewhat helpful, but it's not as helpful as it could be based on what our actual QPF forecast. In contrast, I'm going to show you currently what we're forecasting. We're expecting another one of these events this weekend. Um, so if you're watching on TV at home, especially Saturday night, in the lower left is a graphic that right now we're you've sent to our partners and is running on our webpage. Notice now, um, no, we're not in a, in a sense we're issuing a flash flood watch yet, but notice now we've done a much better job of showing where the highest risk is going to be in the area. So it's clearly our eastern uh, half. Um, notice we even didn't mention extreme yet. We may see extremes. We even reserve that category. But we think this is a much better way to give partners and the public an idea of where the problem area is going to be. And even more importantly, notice now in the lower right, it corresponds very well to our actual QPF forecast. And notice here that even on that graphic, we tried to do a better job of, of isolating the area that's really under the highest threat. So we think this is something that everybody could do almost immediately. Um, you know, we don't want graphics like the upper left. We'd like graphics more like the lower right and, and the lower left. Uh, going on, as Greg mentioned, um, most of the uh, river systems uh, in, the, in the continental U.S., uh, there's a lot of basins that have no gauging at all or only have one gauge, such as the Wimberley Basin here. One um, tool and product out there is the uh, Flash Group at OU, and I've got their website address there. Um, they have what they call a crest model that takes MRMS uh, as an input. So as you consider your MRMS training coming up this fiscal year, pay attention to this. They feed it in a crest, and this is a basically a water flow model. Now, this is we went back and got the uh, archive data from them, and Wimberley, again, is the black star. As Greg and I mentioned, notice that um, a lot of the, <clears throat> the hot colors, in essence, which would represent more of the instantaneous rainfall, notice those are all upstream but then you can clearly see where that river channel is in the purples and maroons, and notice how the stream flows are, are quite a bit higher. Now, these are cubic uh, meters per second, so the values are a little bit different than what we were showing earlier with acre feet and so forth. But again, here, clearly, this would if we had been using this tool in real time, it would have given us a much better idea maybe what was going on. And, and even like Greg mentioned, um, notice that little area of yellow that's coming into Wimberley from the north. So that may indicate some flow that came in from a tributary that maybe it hasn't been accounted for or has changed. So this is a really uh, useful tool that's available right now on the website um, that runs real time. So it's something, again, everybody could do right away. However, where we really want to get to is even a more advanced state. Again, in the upper left is the typical basin as we would have it now. Now, there's a project <clears throat> that the University of Texas has run called the National Flood Interoperability Experiment, or NFIE. If we start in that top left and you go down to the bottom left, notice now instead of just these blank basins basically with one point at the end, now I've got something more like 130 catchments or small mini basins. These would be something equivalent to what you'd be used to looking for on FFMP, except that they also handle the routing of the water. It's not just rain on the ground. It's what happens to the water 
so obviously that's a big spatial improvement. If we switch over to the right, <clears throat> currently we have um, 6,600 basins and are roughly 3,600 forecast points. Those basins are roughly 400 square miles. Notice now when we go to NFIE, we have something more like 2.7 million of these stream reaches with a catchment reach of maybe more like one square, uh, one square mile. And it's uh, basically like a national flow network. The really important news with this is that the inner, uh, initial operating capability of the water center working between NCAR and the University of Texas is to have this running um, at the water center uh, next May. Um, so this runs on an hourly uh, basis, basically. It's forced by the HER um, in terms of hourly forecasts, uh, MRMS as far as what's already fallen. And then it even goes out further with um, downscaling of things like the NAM and the HER and even ensemble members. So it's a real exciting thing that's coming forth. Now, again, it's still a model, so it's not going to be perfect, and there needs to be a lot of calibration work done. But we definitely have uh, the prospects of higher resolution. Even if we get that from the model, though, you still have to meet that gap to the partners. So um, one of our forecasters, Jared Allen, has been working on this type of thing. So this is an inundation mapping. Um, and this is the gauge at Wimberley. So on the left there, if you've spent any time on the AHAPS page, you're, you're used to looking at graphics such as that. On the right is what we want to go to, <clears throat> where it's inundation mapping uh, at various uh, flood levels. And so in this case, the little white boxes in the center indicate the lowest end of the major flood category, whereas the purple extent indicates the upper end of major flood. So it gives us a little bit of a range. You know, we don't want to get people getting overly specific on, well, it looks like water's in my house or not in my house. We've got to communicate that degree of uncertainty there. So that's why we're trying to do that. So you can do a thing like this, and then also you can do it for different levels. So this would be for major flood. As I switch to the next graphic, you'll see now what we've done would be for record flood. And notice also uh, on the right there that this is done uh, with, uh, with um, ArcGIS's story map feature. Notice here that we can also include pictures and other information, and we think that um, has much better capability for our partners and the public to understand what's going on versus the current flooding impacts we have, which tend to be somewhat generic. You can see that in the purple text on the left uh, underneath the hydrograph. Um, they tend to be more generic, whereas we can get much more specific uh, on the right. Lastly, then, <clears throat> we also want to try to get this out as, to the lowest level possible. Um, in other words, to first responders and the public. So the city of Austin has an initiative that they'd like to have all their first responders have something like a flood handbook. It would not only be maybe a, a paper or laminated thing, but also a, something viewable on an iPad. <clears throat> and what that would look like then is this is taking that inundation mapping I showed a slide or two ago, except now we're overlaying um, locations of homes, roads, basically anything you could have in a GIS coverage. And notice now we're getting very specific in terms of not only which homes would be flooded by the color coding, how deep the water might be according to the model, but notice in the action table there, we talk about actions that even a police car could take in terms of barricading a road or blocking a road, um, in terms of response time, uh, alerting people, do you need to do reverse 9-1 and such. And this is a real exciting thing coming down the line and, and will really make a difference, I think, in people not only having higher confidence in the flash flood warnings, but then taking appropriate actions. Again, now, this also is all going to depend on the quality of the model. It's going to depend on the quality of the inundation mapping from the model. And in terms of a forecast sense, it's then going to depend on how good our forecast is. If we try to say an event's coming 12 hours from now, you know, how accurate is our forecast? So anyway, with all those exciting things coming on, um, that's the end of our presentation. And Greg and I certainly would be happy to answer any questions. The conference is now in talk mode. All right, the lines are open. So anybody who has a question or a comment for Greg or the team at Austin San Antonio. Yeah, John, this is Matt. I have a question on your, your flash flood warning. It looks like you had six hours of lead time on that. So I'm wondering how you're handling that, if, you've, if you actually issue a six-hour warning and then issue another one, or if you've modified your config and AWIP so you can have a longer warning, like eight or nine hours. Yeah, hi, Matt. Um, no, we, we've... Definitely, um, I, I don't know how that would necessarily run against uh, directives because um, flash flood is, is supposed to be defined as six hours or less. Um, what we try to do is control our area. We, we try to go with as small of a polygon uh, as we can. Uh, so in essence, we don't, we don't, we try to, in essence, follow, have the polygons follow the flood, if you will, especially if it's in a routed case like this down a river. 
versus, say, blasting just a large area. Um, but, yeah, it, it's something that definitely we're going to need to consider as we go to this new flood system because there is going to be a potential there. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's similar to maybe what people have seen with facets. There would be a potential in the five to ten year time range, um, especially if you already had some floodwaters coming down a stream and you're going to have additional rainfall to actually make a six to 12 hour forecast. And so then we would need to have uh, appropriate um, products or services to, to meet that. So that's definitely something we'll have to look at in the future. Hey, John. Yes. Yeah, this is Victor from Southern Region. I had a quick question for you. You know, by the way, you know, wonderful presentation for you and Wally, but my question is for you, John. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you mentioned the start of your presentation, the sort of the two products you issued, the partner emails, and then I guess you touched upon the special weather statements, et cetera. What is the difference between those two products? I mean, is the content different? Um, is the, you know, is the content different? Is there different uh, levels or verbiage of uh, uncertainty or certainty or impacts that's mentioned in those two briefings? And is that something that, that's been looked at in any of these service assessments, uh, you know, making sure those two are consistent, or et cetera? Right, that's a good question. Um, actually, uh, at, at our office, we we basically um, treat everything, uh, all outlets, as the same. Uh, so what would go in a partner briefing as far as the explanation versus a special weather statement or the web page versus social media, we try to make those as consistent as possible. The differences might be is with our partner group, we assume that we can speak at a slightly elevated level in terms of the meteorology or the impacts uh, versus the general public. Um, we also have a little bit more space and, and, and freedom from product restrictions in a partner email. Uh, we could put graphics with it. That's, again, something that's a little bit difficult to do with our standard product suite to, to marry things up. I mean, you can. We do that. We tie things from our, our web page you know, to the, to the backing products, but it's a little harder. Um, the other thing we can address with our partners um, is, is maybe some more specific impacts to that. I mentioned the, the issue about mutual aid. One of the issues that came up with the flood we had in 2010 is, is the, the um, fire chief thought that it was a widespread flood, so he didn't call for mutual aid. And one of his comments we did when we did an after-action review is he said, if I would have known that this flood was just isolated to our city and county, he said, I could have had 20 more swift water rescue crews from San Antonio, you know, assisting us within, within a half hour or so. So one of the things we've taken for that is we try to express in our partner email the extent of the flooding in, in terms of that. We might specifically mention something on the order of, um, you know, mutual aid uh, should be possible because it, the, the flooding impacts will be isolated to one or two areas, or we might say mutual aid may be difficult because um, the, the event's going to be widespread. That's something you wouldn't put on a public web page probably. Um, but it's definitely something we consider and, and try to make sure we're as consistent as we are across all channels. Hi, I had a question for the WFO. This is Julie in Wilmington, Ohio. Um, your impact graphics, did you do any kind of like a Google survey poll or anything, any kind of feedback from the users? They're great graphics, by the way. I'm just kind of curious what kind of feedback you've gotten. Um, no, we didn't We didn't do that. Um, we, we didn't do it, basically, so that's the short answer. Um, the, the longer answer is uh, actually in preparation uh, for this talk, when, when Jamie first approached us back in the summertime about doing it, one of the things as we were sort of putting the graphics together, we, we, we sort of, you know, caught ourselves, especially with that upper left graphic where the whole CWA, I mean, I mean, it's, you know, we say there's a flash flood watch and we've got excellent timing. It occurred with Saturday afternoon to Sunday evening. That's fine. And we've got amounts there. They were a little light, but, you know, that's okay. But then we sat back and said, well, okay, that's nice. But, you know, if I'm anywhere in our CWA, is that flood risk really the same? And we knew right away the answer was no. I mean, in almost every case, the risk isn't the same across your CWA. So that's when we got looking at some of these other ways and thought, um, you know, that we can do a better job. Now, you know, some people are going to have a concern, of course, over how specific do you get how early, right? Um, you know, you don't want to be, um, you know, if you're too specific too early, then people take that to the bank and then, the, you know, there's a system develops. It turns out it's 100 miles to the west or whatever. Um, of course, that's a nice notion, but in reality today, everybody's got access to models themselves anyway, and, and you're seeing tons of graphics uh, reposted. So, 
the way we look at it is, is we're still, at least in our CWA, and I think most across the weather service, you're still considered the authoritative source. And so, um, you know, put the, put the best forecast you can out at the time you do, and then just let people know that it's a dialogue. It's not look at the forecast on Wednesday and then don't look at it again until Saturday. It's the type of thing that on Wednesday we're trying to alert you that the event is coming and, and look at some of the amounts and think about how that may impact whatever your decision-making is. And then as we get closer to the event, hopefully the timing and the, and the specificity improve. Um, but I definitely agree with you for the original premise of your question that, that definitely um, some more uh, study in, the, in the, how graphics are used and how effective they are would, would be beneficial. I'm going to pause right now, John. First of all, uh, give your voice a, a moment. Just to call time, it's a little after 1230, and I want to let those of you that um, – have other things that you need to attend to, to drop off. And those of you that want to stay, we will continue the conversation. So we'll just pause for a minute or so. Okay, uh, the wizard says uh, we got very few who dropped off, so I think that means we need to continue the conversation. Hey, this is Eric up in Tulsa. I had a question for Wally. Um, on the rainfall, do you ever try to do a reanalysis to see that, uh, you know, if you're underestimating quite a bit considering that the amount of rainfall was half the volume that you saw at the gauge, so expect to maybe even double your precip at least. So did you ever go back and try to do a reanalysis of it? Eric, after I put my head in my hands and cried, uh, I did do a model simulation, and the only way that we would have been able to estimate the correct volume of water during this event was to put in six-hour period, 21 inches of rain, three times the actual amount, mean aerial, followed up by another six-hour period of 21 inches of rain. So, you know, right off the bat, you know, it was going to take 42 inches of rain to simulate the volume. What we did, you know, there's also some runoff calculations and some soil moisture that, you know, we know those parameters can be tweaked. But we have heard from the Edwards Aquifer Authority and others that because this May was so wet that there is the possibility that some groundwater streams, their surface level, you know, they came up to the surface. So we may have been seeing water contributions that were not 100% surface driven and there may have been groundwater issues. That's a theory right now that was brought up just a couple of weeks ago, but we've asked the GS, we've asked others, you know, can you take a look into it to try to find out the volume of water that went in. We think our precip estimates were pretty good. If we would have doubled the rain, it still would not have been enough, assuming 100% runoff. Were, were there a lot of gauges up in the upper part of this basin where it rained? Did you have a lot of ground truth? Not a lot of real-time gauges. Uh, there are some cooperative gauges. Um, from this event, we are looking to add 10, uh, I believe, 10 rain gauges and three to four more river gauges to help us with this. But you know, we did have cooperative, uh, the COCO RAS and the cooperative observers in the 24-hour to go along with a few uh, hourly rain gauges. John, this is Kevin at Birmingham. I think you've made a good point. You almost made it in passing there, but I think it was an important point that I wrote down here as a good takeaway from this, and that's the idea that sort of once we get set in stone, this is especially true for uh, in context with event timing, but sort of once we get set in stone that there is an obvious lack of information that flow that sort of precedes a lot of these events. And, you know, the, the, in conjunction with the fact that everybody now is their own meteorologist, and we all know how that goes, that a lot of misinformation can sort of start to creep in without us getting back on that wagon and staying on it all the way up until that event. I think that's a good takeaway here and something I'm going to restress to our crew, and that's really for any event, not just flooding, obviously. So I think that was a great takeaway. Thanks for that. No, thank you. I appreciate it, and I obviously definitely agree. This is Pat at Northern Indiana. I have probably several questions, but um, maybe if you could speak a little bit 
of the uh, Blanco River, uh, the basin, the channel characteristics? Was it, is, did it have a history of being flashy? I mean, obviously, eight and a half billion uh, cubic feet will uh, do anything to any basin, but, uh, you know, like, is there any canyon uh, topography or constrictions in the channel? I'm not familiar with the area. And also did, um, at Bridges, I'm thinking similarities to Johnstown, uh, Pennsylvania flood where, you know, uh, debris dams formed at, uh, at Bridges and kept the uh, flood wave focused as it uh, came into town. John, you want those? You want me to jump on them? Oh, why don't I go first? Because you're, you're going to be more of an expert uh, on it than I am. So I think everyone should be able to see. I pulled up a, a graphic that we use a lot. Um, the, this basically we, we've taken the major cities from Dallas, Fort Worth through San Antonio, and then the the, the color coding is shaded by elevation. Now um, we've made it a little more dramatic. It's not like we've got the front range of the Rockies here, but basically along the I-35 corridor, which goes from Dallas through Waco Temple to San Antonio. The elevations roughly along there uh, are in the in the three to four hundred feet range, and then as you get rapidly into the hill country or the Balcones escarpment just to the west, you, you jump up three to four hundred feet more, and then you get up almost two thousand feet up in the white areas. So the issue we have here is this is all limestone, so uh, these canyons are are pretty. A lot of these tributaries are pretty narrow. A lot of these uh, rivers and streams are maybe a hundred yards across at normal flow. Um, but the problem with the limestone is the soil. Um, the soil depth is in in terms of in the in the reds and yellows there, um, maybe two to three inches. So like in my backyard, for example, I live on the west side of New Braunfels. I can't dig more down more than about three or four inches before I hit bedrock, if you will, or limestone. So the problem is is that's almost uh, not quite, but almost like impervious cover. And so uh, and of course our proximity to the Gulf of Mexico, we're only uh, 125 miles away. So it's very frequent for us to get these uh, 15 to 25 inch rainfall amounts in 12 hours or less. And then when you put that in impervious cover basically and then channel it quickly, um, the kind of rises you saw here, these 25 to 30 foot rises, every single river in our county warning area has had that happen. And I've been in the Sioux here 13 years, every single river in our county warning, county warning area has had that happen at least once, most of the rivers two, three, four times. And I'll turn it back over to Greg here to give you a little bit more, and then and he'll explain the problem he's got is that I'm one CWA, and West Gulf has a, has a much larger area to deal with. All right, thanks, John. Yes, uh, especially with just how moist we were heading into this event, for all intents and purposes, that little tiny layer of soil on top of the limestone was saturated. So we were going into the event with saturated soils, uh, what we would consider a steep slope, rocky, and normally, for John's area, the West Gulf RFC, anything over an inch and a half, and you, you better start looking and focusing on those river systems. So we just showed you that there's a 12 to 13 inch bullseye in a small little section. The tributary is actually the Little Blanco River, which flows into the Blanco, and it has some, some steep slopes uh, along with it, well, relatively steep slopes going into it. So, yes, you combine the fact of, of uh, steep slopes, almost no soil moisture with almost you know, all rock, it's rapid runoff, uh, so those basins respond very, very fast. John mentioned that, you know, they're only one. You know, we, I think we have like 14 uh, weather forecast offices in our area. You know, the ones across Texas, right along the central portion, they, they tend to respond the fastest. So, you know, when we have big rain events in central Texas, we really have to heighten and focus it because it just behaves so much quicker and so much rapidly than, say, some of ours uh, further south and east in the state. Awesome. Um, and you probably said it earlier. Um, the gauge went away at 40 feet. Was there? What was the prior record? And 33 was the major uh, category. And I also wanted to know, a specific with the FFW product, uh, was the word the the wording that came came out of Orange Gin um, was the canned wording wording kept or was it uh, modified to be specific to uh, this event? Yeah, uh, I'll take this. So we've got, I put the graphic back up. So major flood stage was, was somewhere more around 27, 28 feet. The record on this, I think, 
you can see the bar there. I think the exact value I thought was 33 feet. Um, Greg, you can correct me if, if you know different. And then, Greg, wasn't it the USGS, their final estimate was a little over 45 feet? Is that correct? The one that I have written down is 44.9. Okay. Yeah. Right at 45 so this, feet. This exceeded the record flood stage um, by over 12 feet or, or by more than 25%. So even for our area, um, that was exceptional, um, obviously. Uh, as far as the wording um, in the products, you know, we definitely just didn't make a couple selections off Warren Gen and, and push that back out. Um, you know, anytime you're issuing a flash flood emergency, um, you know, the the way to really make that product go is to have the specifics in there that are unique to that event. Um, so, you know, people, if they see an emergency, they're going to, they'll get a little, you know, higher interest anyway. Um, but to really have the specifics in there. And so, again, we, we were very specifically mentioning anywhere we could. Um, again, if we had, we had, had uh, you know, an inundation map done ahead of time and that, we could have even been more specific. But I, I think a lot of studies have shown that if you can be specific, you know, this road is like, and you can use words like likely to be blocked, you know. So, you know, I know, I know a lot of meteorologists have a tremendous level of discomfort with, you know, being extremely specific because you know that you can't possibly know what's going on everywhere, you know, in your area. But, you know, especially once you, if your staff's lived in the area for a long time, you know the trouble spots ahead of time. Um, you can work with your emergency managers, which you're supposed to do in a flash flood emergency anyway. Um, work with your emergency managers, sheriff's offices, fire departments, and, and try to use any kind of, of wording you can to, to get people to take action. That's the bottom line at the end of the day. Thank you very much. This is uh, Justin at WDTD, and it's, it's fairly obvious and I'm sort of preaching to the choir, but I wanted to point out that with the level of success that occurred in this event, uh, it's clear that a lot of effort went into the science and the messaging before the event occurred, which is why it was as successful as it was. But what I really liked, I guess about 15 minutes in, you said, but we think we can get better. And then we proceeded to talk about ways that we could message this event better that directly went into how we're going to handle the next event. And I just really wanted to point that out and not take that for granted at how important that effort is into getting better. And, and that effort I know has existed there at New Braunfels and at West Gulf uh, in the time I've worked with uh, folks there for a long time. And I think that it's pretty clear that's why that this uh, event went as well as it did uh, and just sort of encourage everyone to uh, always look at, at what can be done better, even when it's, uh, it's pretty obvious that it went well. Yeah, thanks, Justin. I, I, I would add uh, one thing, and this gets back to the earlier question about surveys. Um, we are going to have, um, if you look at some of the situational awareness tables um, that, that Trevor Al Alcott's developed out in the Western region and it's across the country now, if you look at some of the values for that, um, we're talking record levels here for this coming uh, Friday and especially Saturday um, across at least central Texas, um, but it looks like it may be focused on our CWA. So um, if, if someone has the time and inclination over the next three, four, five days to look at our area and look at, at things we're issuing, either social media, on our web page, whatever, um, we'll take any kind, of, um, any kind of comments we can. And, and don't worry about them being real time. And you're not going to hurt anyone's feelings here because our, our motto at our office is, is, is just to simply do a better job uh, um, every day. And even if that's just one small email or one phone call, um, we feel we feel successful with that, and of course, anything above that is just more icing on top of the cake. And Justin, uh, to pile on to, to what John is saying, uh, don't underestimate the relationships beforehand. Um, you know, working at West Gulf and with John, you know, he said 13 years. Our experience goes back even further than that. He and I, uh, and the, the working relationships really matter because when you're dealing with an event that goes past the model that is the statistically rare event that's so critical in this nature, you know, the relationships are what helped us try to share information, communicate, communicate the forecast, and communicate just how dangerous this was. So I want to point out that, that the relationship aspect also needs to be highlighted because when you're talking real time, with, you know, coordinating with the individuals on the other end of the phone uh, to try to highlight the, the seriousness of the situation, you, you just can't put a, a value on that. Hey, John and, and Wally, this is Victor. Another quick question. Um, I feel your pain, both you guys, having lived in Texas for 30 years and seen some 
this ridiculous uh, heavy rains and attendant flooding. But I, I keep coming back to soil moisture and, and the, the lack or our lack of soil moisture data. Um, there's been, you know, Dr. Queering, Dr. Stephen Queering at a Texas A&M University is one of, one of the more preeminent people, I think, nationally with regard to trying to establish some, some kind of a national soil moisture network. And I know NOAA recently, I think I saw a blurb, is spending $11 million, I think, on some kind of a national mesonet, et cetera. Um, at least from a Texas perspective, if not from a national perspective, what can we do in the Sioux community, the climate community, the warning preparedness, you know, you name it across the board from NWS, to get some movement going or some traction going in regards to having in place some kind of a soil moisture network? I mean, do we even know where to turn to, honestly, for to spearhead this thing? And there's a lot of supplemental funding lately for, you know, different projects, different big events. Um, are we aware of anything going on with regards to soil moisture networks? Victor, uh, this is, you know, Wally West Golf. I do, we do know that there are individual operators, one associated with the, uh, that, that university that resides in Austin, uh, another with the Lower Colorado River Authority, uh, and other river authorities that are testing out and putting out some soil moisture, uh, you know, calibration units, whatever. Uh, the kicker is, is once that data comes in, the River Forecast Center models, you know, are simulated based on the Sacramento Soil Moisture Accounting model and, how would we be able to put this data at, you know, at these various steps uh, into our river model and be able to use it? So while we would love to have the data, there's also the next step of trying to, uh, uh, of trying to figure out how to use it operationally. Well, is this a role perhaps for the National Water Center or a possible role for the National Water Center to, since they're national in scope, to try and oversee this, coordinate this regionally or nationally? I would think that would be an, an excellent opportunity. Yeah, Victor, this is John adding adding to what uh, uh, Greg said. Now, with this new NFIE model, that's going to have a land surface component, and, and the soil moisture would be uh, the soil moisture analysis would be included in that. Of course, if you don't have the base data, you're just analyzing a lot of interpolation. W one thing to put out there for everyone to think about, and this goes back to my first days is in the agricultural weather program for the Weather Service, is there's a big push for weather ready nation and climate information, but the Weather Service fundamentally stepped away from agriculture back in 1995. And even though there's an understanding that the private sector can fill a lot of roles with that in terms of integrating weather data into, into GIS modeling in the tractor cab, um, Steve Amber and the recently retired Sue at Tulsa um, pointed out to me that there is a role for the Weather Service more from a public safety standpoint regarding agriculture and that um, there's already a ready-made network of most states of agricultural uh, extension agents to, to, to work with and utilize that information and get that kind of thing going. Um, it's on my big giant to-do list, probably about number 48 on there, but I think the Weather Service is missing a tremendous opportunity. Agriculture is probably the fourth or fifth largest industry sector in the U.S. economy. Um, and I think we're missing a tremendous opportunity. And the fact that you've got those county extension agents is the equivalent of having county emergency managers. You've already got a, a structure in place of how to get that information directly in the hands uh, of the general public and decision makers. So that's something that at least I've got on my big giant to-do list. Maybe you and I could talk offline, but if anyone else uh, has an agricultural background or most of your CWA is, that's that's definitely something, um, you know, to consider, and, and a soil moisture network would be one specific type of example of work that could be done. Hi, this is uh, Scott with Mid-Atlantic River Forecast Center. Um, great talk. I just want to say that to me this event looks like it was warned for, uh, it was state of the art in my opinion, and the science has come a long way. You know, 25, 30 years ago, this event could have killed hundreds of people. Who's to say? But my point is, is this event really hits home for me the importance of social science. You know, there's always going to be people that make personal decisions that end up causing them their lives. So whenever there's a disaster survey report, the social science portion of that survey must not be neglected. 
We have to find out what is driving people to make improper decisions. Uh, that's all I wanted to add. I can't resist jumping in here. One of the things that I love about Storm of the Month is um, the conversations that go on and what underlies the conversations always is um, a passion for the mission. And I'm hearing a lot of that. So uh, I'm not calling it over. I just had to jump in at this time. Is there anybody else with another question or comment? Yeah, this is James up at the Tulsa River Forecast. And I was just had a couple questions about the inundation maps that were produced. Um, what was the hydrologic data that was used in creating those? And also, um, was there any verification? Has there been any verification done as far as the coverage of that, how, how well they're verified in, in, in that event, if those coverage areas were, were good, or are they or what sort of verification was done on those? Right. Um, so uh, our, our wonderful Mr. Allen is currently at the NWA meeting, so quit get in the car and drive down to Norman, I guess. Um, here's the deal. So so Jared Allen's one of our, our lead forecasters. He came to our office from the Jackson, Mississippi office about a year ago. And when he was at Jackson, he actually had a rotational assignment uh, to the Corps of Engineers at Vicksburg, and they used the FISM model, F-E-S-M, which the hydrology guys probably know what that is, they used, he used that uh, to basically to do the mapping. Um, of course, the quality of the mapping is going to depend on whether you've got LIDAR data or you're using a digital elevation model, et, et cetera. So in some places, um, like the city of Austin, any, any major urban area, you probably have LIDAR, which is you know, highly accurate, you know, maybe one meter. Um, in a place like this on the Blanco, it's going to be more of a digital elevation model, maybe more like a 10-meter thing. Um, in his work that he did at Jackson, he did uh, do a lot of verification of that uh, with, with past events. Um, this mock-up, um, remember this event was just Memorial Day, so he's worked this up and we're in the process now of going back with the emergency manager and, and taking a look at this. Let me actually switch just to the record flood since we actually exceeded the record flood. Anywhere that you see this purple, since we exceeded the record amount, should have been flooded, right? So that's one way we can go back and look. Um, so we actually are doing that in the process of it right now. Um, the method that he uses to do this is, is, is fairly straightforward. I would say any um, service hydrologist for sure could do it, or even, even a, a, a very dedicated hydrofocal point. Of course, it's like anything, um, you know, basically it's similar to, to what's on the AHAPS page for inundation mapping in terms of it's maybe, you know, highly accurate a mile or two each side of the gauge. Um, if you get an area where you know, there's no gauge for 10 miles, like the upper reaches of this basin, um, we don't know. Um, the, the attitude that we're sort of taking with this is, um, you know, there's this, again, it gets back to that gap. You know, we, we have a pretty good idea what happens at river gauges. You know, the, the data is fairly good quality and so forth. But at the end of the day, if you're anyone from an emergency manager down to fire truck number one, um, the, the fire truck number one, you know, when you call 911, they say, first, what's your emergency? And the second question is, where are you at? And the problem we have right now is, is the, we issue a lot of warnings and statements, and we give information at the gauge site. And a lot of people, locals, know if the gauge is X, this is what my property, you know, deals with. But there's a lot of areas where the people don't know what that relationship is. And then another aspect, which uh, Greg and I haven't talked about, is our area of Central Texas, I think we've got three of the top ten fastest growing counties in the U.S., and this Hayes County is one of them. So even if you had done an extensive study, let's say ten years ago, um, of land cover and land use, it's already outdated. And so that's a real challenge in terms of getting any kind of accurate information because you've changed the cover, you've changed the areas under threat. Um, I think someone else, I don't know if you're someone else that mentioned structures, we've got another county um, Williamson County, where they built 21 of these small metering dams that didn't exist 20, uh, 20, 25 years ago. And that's not modeled how those interact with, with, with the flow, or at least not very well. And so there's a lot of work here to do. I think our goal at the end of the day is we want to try to do a lot of this inundation mapping. This isn't something we're just going to turn out to the public next week. We wouldn't even dream of doing that. What we want to do is start doing some of this for our, our, our likely locations to get flooding, start looking at it internally, 
Um, and, and we can also maybe, using the NFIE, rerun some past events. We've got a partners project with UT to do that. The hope is, is that if we get some handle on the accuracy of this, that then we could introduce it to our emergency management partners um, over the next couple of years. And then the hope would be, say, in 10 years, that we would have, you know, anywhere where there's a significant flood risk, so population plus the risk of actual flash flooding, that we would have those areas mapped. Are we ever going to map the whole CWA? Probably not. We've got some very rural areas. You're going to have no data input there. And frankly, it's a rural area anyway. The rancher living there probably knows more about the river than I ever would. Um, so we wouldn't we wouldn't ever do that. But for the urban areas, you know, suburban areas, um, that's where we'd like to go with it. So um, I know if you have a follow-up, I'd probably try to answer all your questions. But it's it's an important thing, definitely, exactly what the accuracy of these things are. This is Mike Moxley from WDTV. I have just one question, or at least an, an issue. In the old days of the WDM workshops, we, we had a number of, of good discussions in certain uh, certain events and certain training uh, realms of the, the challenge of uh, including precision and the dangers of the customers inferring uh, more accuracy when we have a higher precision in our estimates, and in, in particular on your graphic for the five-day rainfall totals, which will say 4.78 inches in one city and then 4.92 in, in the others. And, and so there's, there's kind of a Sometimes we have that precision that's meaningful. Other times, like in this sort of situation, you know, in reflecting back on some of the, the problems in, in the past, I think it was some river flooding up in the northern plains of, uh, of people, uh, partners inferring that we're really not, you know, that we're they're more precise than we actually could be, uh, that maybe in these kind of instances it might be better to just broad brush contours that say four to five inches, local amounts eight to ten, and then when we start to do these, you know, nearest hundredth of an inch five days out that, that people might misinterpret that. So that's just something to think about when you're kind of reflecting on, on what kind of messages are getting sent. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I, I think that's an artifact of the of the SAC image maker we're using. But I I agree that we definitely you know at a, at a three to five day uh, forecast aren't aren't forecasting accuracy to the nearest hundredth for sure. We have silence. Uh, John and Wally and company, I think you guys have set a record for the length of the question and answer session, and that actually is a kudo to you for uh, providing such um, um, valuable information and thoughtful information. So I'm going to make this a last call before John's voice dies entirely. Otherwise, for those of you who are still on the call, thank you for coming. And um, I tried the link, Aaron, for the updated version of the Storm of the Month PowerPoint, and I didn't get it. Do I need to wait until we've finished? Uh, yeah, he'll resend it to you shortly. Oh, I see. It hasn't been sent yet. Okay. All right, excellent. All right, it's been a pleasure working with you guys. Beautiful job. Great conversation. We appreciate it. Thanks so much, Jamie. We appreciate all your help. All right. Thanks, Jamie. Take care. Bye-bye.